We actually got a real job site to go on to here today, so we're going to do our very best job to go over tile and explain to you guys some of the details, some of the little intricate things that can cause you problems or save you a lot of time. So we talk about bullnose tile being on a tile countertop and that we can just pop this bullnose off and shoot trim on here, whatever size you want. And we could do that, but if you notice, the top tile actually overhangs the bullnose tile, the edge tile, whatever the edge piece, um, so much that if we were to pull this edge piece off, we'd actually have to run some, probably grab some three quarter inch um, MDF, um, cut a filling strip here, a furring strip to fur this out, and then we'd actually have to shoot a piece of trim to that. Um, and this customer also wants a chiseled edge, like a natural rock edge, which we're gonna be going over later and showing you how to do that. Um, but with all things considered, I think it would be probably best for us just to actually trowel straight to the existing substrate instead of popping this tile off. So if you're on a job site and you don't have this issue and you have um, edge tile, you may want to actually pop the edge tile off um, and shoot a piece of trim or casing, something nice, decorative, um, and shoot it straight to this and you'll have a brand new edge. But in the case where they want a rock edge, it's not going to happen like that. On this job, they're also wanting a full height backsplash that goes up to the top of the bottom cabinets. I think it looks cleaner when you can pour the actual countertop straight up to it um, so it's seamless so you don't have a caulk joint back here. So I'm actually going to build our backsplash first, um, make dry fit it, pour it at the shop, come and install it, and then we're going to pour our base countertops going right up to that backsplash. So it's going to be really cool. If you guys notice, most of these tiles on the backsplash come all the way out or very close to the edge of the actual front of the countertop. And we're wanting to build a, um, a very thin panel that will glue straight over this tile here. It's gonna look very nice. We're gonna lose a quarter of an inch of this countertop, which is not significant. And I'm gonna do a little false edge to cap over this and go tight to my wall. If I didn't do that um, and have that little false edge on there, um, then you just had a panel stuck up here, you'd be exposing and showing the edge of this tile. You'd have a lot of, um, a pretty large gap here that you'd need to caulk in or wall epoxy or something and take care of. Um, I always tell epoxy guys, if you wanna make money, go into the jobs that are very difficult for anyone else to do. And for us, this isn't gonna be a lot harder than any other job. So we're gonna be doing it in place, not in a shop. So that's probably the biggest impact to us is the fact that we can't just do this offsite and bring it in. I'm gonna um, start out by building my backsplashes and making sure that they dry fit really nicely. So they're gonna do a white marble. It'll be nice and clean and very open in this small kitchen. So right now I'm just making some very accurate measurements as accurately as possible so I can go out and fabricate everything in the driveway on sawhorses. And of course you wanna be pretty accurate with your measurements, but I usually will cut my backsplash the average full height backsplash is 18 inches because that's the minimum height for countertops to be off the working surface of a countertop. So the bottom of the upper cabinets need to be 18 inches off the top of the working surface of the countertop. Um, this right here is exactly at 18 inches, but the tile is just a tiny bit uneven. So I'm gonna cut it just a hair under 18 because I don't believe there'll actually be a gap. I'm gonna be um, cutting all these pieces here at the house. I like to do it on location if I can, because it's a pretty quick process. I should be able to have this done within 45 minutes or an hour and a half, if, even if it's real complex. Um, the reason I like to do it on site is I can run these panels in dry fit them right inside and make sure if there's any little modifications I can do it here on site. I'm only cutting for the backsplash quarter inch MDF, but I always just leave a blank sheet of MDF down here. Um, I'll usually set my saw blade to be just slightly over a quarter inch depth. So you'll have little scores in this bottom sheet, but then you can really slide your pieces around. It gives you a really nice work surface. I'm gonna get to going. I'm cutting full length strips, 18 inches tall, because most of my backsplashes in there are 18 inches tall. So I'm gonna cut some strips and then I'm gonna start um, notching out what we actually need. So many aspects of construction, um, people are very intimidated by, even young men that start out in construction, especially ladies. Um, if you notice, it's just a lot of very intricate measurements and women have uh, more natural attention to detail than a lot of men. If I was to trust a guy or a woman to do this the first time, I'd probably trust a woman to come out here and do this correctly. So don't be intimidated. It's also quarter inch sheeting, so it's very easy to work with. Um, there's nothing to be intimidated by a full height backsplash and adding a full height backsplash um, when you're bidding a job at 55 to 85 dollars a square foot and you're able to add on really thin very easy quick um, material like this your price just goes up and you make a lot more money very quickly remember not to overcut your outlet hole because 
Um, you have two things. You want the screws that are holding the actual outlet. So these little ears need to actually hang on top of your backsplash. So I'm usually trying to bisect this right between the screw and between here. So just so these ears still catch, um, but you're not covering up the screw hole that needs to be covered because we'll need to undo these screws after we mount our backsplash, pull this forward and we'll have to put those screws back in. So if you cut your backsplash hole, the hole for your outlet too small, um, you're not gonna be able to get those screws back in. So be accurate when you measure. Also, if you haven't cut your power, be very careful. Don't touch the screws on the side because those are hot electricity in there. Howdy, people. So, all right. There's a lot of different methods to join a seam together on a backsplash or a shower panel wall or whatnot. Um, so today we're working with quarter inch MDF, which is nice, lightweight, thin, easy to work with. It's, um, it's just not a big hefty piece to be toting around. It's also very easy to seam. A lot of times I'll take two factory edges, brush my countertop epoxy on that edge, um, and then just butt them together to make a seam. And as long as you have a really good smooth contact all the way down, like a factory edge or a really straight soft cut, that's very adequate. Um, today, we have a really small piece and I don't want to wait for countertop epoxy to cure. So I'm actually going to use Gorilla Glue, which it's more of a fast drying super glue. And we're going to do the same with that. Now, I wouldn't trust this method if you were going to transport it prior to pouring your top coat of epoxy over it or move it. So, but since I can do the same, um, seal it up, pour my top coat on top without moving it at all, I believe this will be adequate. So um, I might have to go over it with a little bit of Bondo just because super glue won't do a really good job at filling the gap. It'll just bind the two pieces. So here we go. It's really simple. I use these small standard paper clips. So if you want it to cure immediately, you sprinkle a little bit of baking soda over where you super glued it. And any form of super glue works really well, uh, but the gel will stand up and squish out of the joint better. Um, I wouldn't do this on a huge panel um, just because it is tough to get it really flat um, with the paper clips and whatnot, um, but it does work adequately. So I actually cut some small strips of quarter inch MDF. It's the same exact material that I'm using for my backsplash. And I'm gonna make some little false edges to cap over the existing tile rather than having to remove that tile to adhere the backsplash flat to the wall. I'm gonna use the same exact glue um, that I did my seam with. And I'm just going to put a small amount um, down the backside and I'm gonna use paper clips to adhere it in place. It's gonna cure really rapidly. It is important to make sure this is flush um, up to the edge, or you're gonna have to use a lot of Bondo and sanding to get it flush. So now we've let the glue dry for approximately five minutes. So now we're gonna mix a little bit of Bondo. You can buy this at Home Depot, Lowe's, or any automotive paint supply shop. Um, very inexpensive and I'm going to mix a very small amount and just fill in any little gaps, cracks or irregularities so I get a really smooth edge the same as I want everywhere else. So I'm going to pull my clips off. I'm actually going to mix straight on my surface here. Now this is not a how to how to mix and apply Bondo video so I'm sure there's some automotive guys out there that will tell me at this but I can make it work well enough for a countertop. I'm just gonna use my existing work surface. A little bit of hardener goes a long ways. If you mix too much on here of the hardener, it's gonna just take all your working time away. Usually just mix by swiping it and scraping down to the bottom every so often. You're wanting to get a really smooth, consistent color without streaks. If you have streaking in it, that means it's inconsistently mixed. Now, just going to apply it straight on my edge.
just gonna leave the excess bondo on the knife. It's a plastic knife, so you can just flex it and pop it right off. I'm just gonna sand this back. Don't go overboard on this. I just want it to be a really smooth transition up over the edge, because remember, this edge here is gonna be a finish edge. So make sure you have a really nice, smooth transition off the front of the backsplash over the edge. Now, I'm gonna be doing a very simple white marble and we are doing it on the backsplashes, um, but then later we're gonna actually have to bring these backsplashes into the kitchen and match the exact same pattern. So whatever I do on here has to be something that I know that I can replicate very easily on the job site. So just be thoughtful of that. If you have any odd angles or areas or if you're trying a new technique, don't do that when you're gonna be pouring multiple sections of the countertop trying to match exactly what you did today. So I'm gonna keep it super simple. Make sure to get the edges nicely. We'll come back and check these a little bit later. Um, we're not gonna want a lot of excess on the top and bottom or you may end up having to sand to get it to fit correctly. So you can have plenty on there. I have some charcoal and some gold sprays. These are 99% isopropyl alcohol mixed with our mica powder. I'm gonna spray everything first and then I'm gonna come back and roll everything in. So it'd be better to start out a little bit lighter and add something than the opposite. swirl through here and I know that I can duplicate this back later on the job site. put any color into this. The customer wants it really simple. Man, never underestimate how much movement you can get using some just drips right off of your exact same base color. Big thing is just be random here. If you're doing something like this, um, don't make little straight lines. Don't make checkerboards, um, tic-tac-toe patterns. Now I'm just gonna move forward. I'm gonna torch. Now you can use a small handheld. You can buy this on the torch department of almost any Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards. Um, and it's considered a weed burner, but again, all it is is a little bit wider spread of a flame. I also like it because I can reach out on job sites with a large island or a peninsula, and I can reach stuff without sticking myself in epoxy. Alcohol, it's gonna also aid in popping any little air bubbles, help level the surface. But if I was to spray this too late and big droplets, you could end up getting fish eyes and divots. Um, just because alcohol is heavy enough to create a depression evaporate out, it cools the epoxy and it doesn't always have time to flow in. So I'm doing this pretty rapidly after pouring, spreading, and torching. Um, and you're gonna see it's gonna give it a really cool broken pattern on the, where the accents are. It's, it's a very light accent, so you might not see it a ton, but in person, that's actually pretty awesome to see. So we're gonna start out by removing all the top drawers. Um, generally, that just makes it a little easier to mask. You have a little bit of space so the masking is not peeling off. I like to run a good two inch piece of tape and you usually only have about three quarters of an inch to an inch between your, um, the bottom of the countertop and the top of the drawer. So removing it just makes masking a lot cleaner and easier. So I don't always pull dr every door off. A lot of times there'll be like a panel here in front of the sink. Um, I don't always remove those because you can still mask. It just makes it a bit easier. So if there's any easy drawers to pull out, pull them out. If you are struggling at all getting the masking um, cleanly in here under the sink, um, just pull this. This is usually a cover plate and there's usually two screws that hold it on. So in there, sometimes it can be a bit of a pain to access between the sink and the inside of the cabinet, um, but not a really big deal. Um, so I'm gonna start removing cabinet doors. I'm gonna run tape right directly underneath the countertop along the top face of my cabinets. And I'm actually gonna stick this to the cabinet first, the tape and drape to that, and then I'm gonna sandwich it with another layer. But 
In a lot of kitchens, grease and oil and different things, wax um, gets built up on these. So I'm going to wash with just regular isopropyl alcohol in a rag along this whole entire edge just to make sure that my tape adheres properly. Be careful if you have faux finish cabinets or something like that. You could run into problems by trying to wash it with alcohol. So make sure if you're worried that the paint's gonna come off, just use soap and water. Here's something right here, the, a lot of dishwashers. If we were to try to mask across here, the dishwasher's too close, protrudes out from the countertop, so it'd be kind of difficult. So what I do is I open the dishwasher up. Most dishwashers, almost every one of them, Almost all dishwashers are secured to the bottom of the countertop by two little clips here and screws. So instead of trying to remove your dishwasher, generally your cabinets are 24 inches deep, but your dishwasher is only about 20 in those cases. So we're probably gonna have room. I'm just gonna pop these screws out and I'm gonna push the dishwasher in so we can just mask right across it. And then we're not disconnecting a bunch of stuff after we finish our um, countertops. We'll just be able to pull the dishwasher out, set the screws right back in the same place and much quicker, non-invasive. So if you notice, I'm spending a lot of time masking my cabinets and my floor off. Customers always call and ask, how do I get epoxy off of my tile, off of my pergo, my hardwood floor, my brick? And my main answer is don't ever get it there in the first place. And I mean, honestly, in the overall scheme of things, spending an hour masking a kitchen is no big deal. Really make sure your corners are good enough. Right here, this is usually where you're gonna pull away if you ever were to have a disaster where your masking pulled off. Usually happens right on these inside corners. So, and there's a good chance if I struggle with my tape and drape that I'll just go ahead and remove this corner door. I'm just using a cheap self-dispensing tape and drape. Um, you can get a masking gun or anything like that, but honestly, I feel like masking guns are so finicky, tough to use. This thing here, you have a brand new cutter every single piece. Um, and just throw them away when they're done. This is cheaper and it's worked for me very well for years. Now, if you notice, I'm setting my tape and drape about halfway down that frog tape. And then I'm gonna come back onto it and I adhere another layer up above so that it really sandwiches this um, tape and drape on there so that nothing gets behind it ever to pull this off. If you wanna have a little bit of extra so you can make a skirt at the bottom to catch the epoxy, sometimes what I'll do is I'll adhere it right here really well, then I grab my piece of masking. All I do is bring it back on itself like this. Now when I pull it down, there'll be enough actual plastic there. I can make a nice little skirt. And then I can tape this down to itself so it's out of the way. We can pull this plastic down 48 inches so there is enough. I'm actually gonna throw another layer down lower on the cabinets as well, just for some redundancy here. We have our existing um, frog tape. We put our tape and drape on top of that and now I'm going to be putting another piece of frog tape right back but all the way back to the top again. This will really sandwich that tape and drape so that it's not as likely um, for epoxy to get behind any of this and pull this off of our cabinet face. Um, and you don't need a whole bunch of excess on the floor but I do want to pull it straight down the cabinet face and I want to push it down into that toe keg. That's where epoxy is going to get. I have that little skirt that I was talking about because I pulled the excess product here. So now I'm going to just tack that down with a little piece of tape to keep it out so epoxy can never get back underneath easily. So right now we're going to be mixing wall epoxy. Um, all it is is it's an epoxy that has a very thick resin so it's not going to sag or drop and we're going to fill in all our tile grout lines. Um, as well as smooth out some of our edges and stuff like that. So you could use other products. Sometimes I use a gypsum with epoxy, but I always have epoxy. Um, if you just were to use gypsum powder or, or concrete or self leveler or bondo, it's not gonna bond very well with ceramic or porcelain. So I would definitely recommend using epoxy and the wall epoxy is just the easiest, fastest way to do it. Make sure you are ready to start troweling this product um, into the voids and where you need it as soon as you mix it because you don't wanna be pouring your hardener in here, um, mixing your product and then trying to run around and try to prep a job site or something like that because this does have a pot life. It's curing just like any other epoxy. So you do wanna get it out of the container, so. We're not gonna mix the color in with this. We're just gonna go clear. I'm 
scraping the sides and the bottom of the pail to get any unmixed A or B off the sides. Take your time, it's pretty thick, so just move slow. A lot of people, um, when they, they drill mix and then they stick mix like we tell them to, and then we're gonna drill mix again because we're trying to get the A and B off. But I see a lot of people, they just mix with a stick and we're not mixing with a stick. Um, we're actually taking that stick and just scraping the edges and bottom. So if you're just mixing in the middle, you're really not, um, it's really not serving any purpose. So, and you'll have tacky soft spots that won't sand easily. We wanna be able to trowel this down and have it cure properly. That's why we're doing it, so we don't have little soft spots. So now we're gonna drill mix it really quick one more time and we'll be ready to trowel. I'm going to get some of this out of the container right now, just so we have more working time. Right now what I'm gonna be doing is mixing 45 minute joint compound um, along with plaster and we're gonna make kind of a crumbly mix. Um, mixing it into the water, we're gonna make a paste and we're gonna trowel that on our edges to make a chiseled edge. Works really well. Just remember we're mixing this with water um, so you will have to let it fully cure. You don't want it just to harden. Just because this bag will help this set up in 45 minutes doesn't mean that the moisture content's out. So we're doing it today so it can cure all night for 24 hours. down the countertop, down my edge. I'm using a little bit of excess on my knife to actually add more. And then as it starts thickening up, I can come back and really shape this with my hands. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna take a little bucket of water, and this is just setting up what I trialed on the edge, but you don't want something this sharp protruding through when you pour epoxy, something that would be difficult to clean or anything like that. So I am gonna come back through by hand and, and water and just kind of massage this into the shape that I want. So now we're coming back and I'm using a variable speed DeWalt buffer here with just a 140 grit sanding disc on it. You could use a regular DA sander or just about anything else for this. Um, even a hand sanding block, it just might be slow. And what I'm gonna be doing is coming around and just trying to smooth up and create a, like a nice profile for the epoxy to pour over the edge of the chiseled edge I just um, trialed the other day. It doesn't take a lot of time, just go nice and slow. Um, and just remember this is the last time, chance you're gonna have to actually change any little profile. You may even have a few little spots to patch with Bondo, so I did bring Bondo today. When you're bonding the actual joint compound right to the edge of porcelain or ceramic tile, it doesn't bond really well until your epoxy goes over it. So just be kind of careful right now during this phase so you don't knock a bunch of chunks off while you're sanding. So I did just finish sanding all the edges and I did knock off two little spots. So I'm just gonna mix up some Bondo and patch those right back in. It'll cure really fast. Bondo is not always the best product to use in the first place to do all the chiseled edges. Even though it bonds really well, that's pretty difficult to work with. So it's good for a patch, a little bit more difficult unless you're very experienced with Bondo to do, do a full chiseled edge. But right now, I'm just gonna patch in a few spots. It should be just fine. All right, now we have our backsplash on the job site, so I'm gonna install it. Make sure to cut the power to the outlets first because the screws on the side are hot, so pulling them through to the new surface um, is a high chance of being shocked. So always be safe, and we'll see if this fits. Now that I test fit the backsplash, you can use silicone or Grabrite. I am using um, Power Grab right here from Loctite. Um, and all I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna put about 10 quarter size dabs on this. You don't wanna run beads because it's unlikely that the backsplash is gonna contact with it all the way down. Whereas running just a blob on the size, like a quarter sized dab on the backsplash and just putting dots every foot or so. so no excess epoxy flows back behind there and creates any issues, gets behind masking or anything. We're pouring over the countertop and it's sealed to the wall, but I still try to seal the bottoms on my backsplashes. Um, we also have a white backsplash and a different color tile. 
So instead of scribing that backsplash in perfectly to all the tile, caulking it, you're gonna get that perfect white and it'll leave a really clean transition when we pour the epoxy. All right, now we're gonna run our edge coat and I'm just using a foam roller and I'm just gonna take my time to really work it in here. Now all I'm trying to do is I'm gonna get a few inches up over the top, but primarily just vertical surfaces. You don't wanna roll your whole entire countertop with this, you just wanna do the edge. So I'll take my time and work through here and that'll give me a really good transition so that when my self-leveling countertop epoxy I pour on here flows over the edge, if it gets a little thin, you're not gonna see any color transition there. We just finished off our edge coat. It's drying right now. And we're gonna go ahead and start mixing our epoxy. I am going to be mixing four gallons in a five gallon mixing bucket using a drill. I'm gonna have to mix very slowly. I'm going to extend the mix time a little bit because sometimes when you're mixing slower with a drill, um, it takes a little longer to adequately mix your product. So make sure once you're up to your temp and you're fully mixed, um, make sure to get it out of that pail. If you notice, I never mask off any of the backsplashes. I just pour very carefully up to them. Um, if you were to mask the backsplash, um, you'd actually end up getting uh, a bunch of the blue tape or whatever color tape stuck and you'd see a line at where it would cure in. So just take your time, be patient with it going flowing up into those edges. And that's definitely the best way to have a really clean transition into your backsplash.